Welcome to the afternoon sessions after Taco Tuesday. We don't need anybody sleeping. So these three lovely ladies have asked me to kick us off. And so I'm going to sing, unlike the BLO. No, I'm kidding. I'm not singing. So I'm Callie Davenport. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm the Oregon State Coordinator of the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. That's me right there. So today we are going to talk a little bit about uh, native plant par uh, native seed partnerships uh, in the state of Oregon. Uh, we're doing a lot of really cool stuff there, and uh, my three colleagues are going to really get into the nuts and bolts of that. But uh, <clears throat> the uh, some of the logos that you see up here are are both our the logos that represent us and then our partnerships. So uh, with that said, I. And I'll give a little bit of overview, but I would like to introduce or have my colleagues introduce themselves. Again, I'm Callie Davenport with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. <laughs> and I'm Kate Wellens with the Institute for Applied Ecology. I coordinate uh, two seed partnerships for the state of Oregon, and I'll talk about both of them. Hi, everybody. Um, Catherine Prive. I'm the executive director of the Understory Initiative the green logo with the grass on it. Um, and also I've been coordinating the Rogue Native Plant Partnership for the last five years with Tula. Hey everyone, I'm Tula Raypon and I work with Catherine at the Understory Initiative and I help uh, coordinate the Rogue Native Plant Partnership and the new Umqua Native Plant Partnership. All right, got the formalities out of the way. Uh, I'm going to, I've got some slides. I got my notes up here, so I'm going to, no, I'm just trying to get my notes. So today we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about our, this is the outline for today for us, this session here. Um, I'm going to kind of lead us through a little bit of, uh, I'm going to talk about a, a case study. I guess it's not really a case study, but it's, it's me. Uh, I'm the case study. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about life before plant partnerships, and then life after plant partnerships, and uh, hopefully that all makes sense. Now we're going to get into some of the, then these guys are going to take over and, keep real, like I said, get the real nuts and bolts of what it takes to get a plant partnership together, and some of the success stories, and then maybe some of the things that we're still uh, looking to accomplish in our plant partnership. So after that, we'll take a few questions. And if time allows, we'll get into, we'll have an opportunity to maybe get into some small group discussions about uh, things that might get stimulated during, during our talk here. So that said, uh, this is me. So I'll kick it off with uh, a little bit more about myself and why I'm here. Uh, again, I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I am the Oregon State Coordinator of the pri our private lands program, the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program. And that, what's that mean? Well, the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program is the services private lands program. And in the uh, scheme of what private lands means for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, it's any non-federal or non-state owned land. So private landowners are pretty much everybody that's non-federal, non-state owned lands. So that includes, obviously, our focus is private landowners, but it also includes non-governmental organizations like the Nature Conservancy, includes Native American tri tribally owned lands, owned and managed lands, um, corporate lands, timber lands, industrial lands, city, municipalities, county owned lands. Uh, so it's a lot, it's like, it kind of spans the gamut of, of the lands that we can work on. So, um, that said, uh, it is a, a vast majority of, of, of lands. Now, out west, where a, a big part of the west is, is publicly owned lands, but we're kind of in the other, the other part of that. Um, so, we, do, we are a voluntary habitat restoration program, and um, we work... Uh, on these privately owned lands for the benefit of the service services federal or trust resources. So our trust resources are kind of a wide range of, of topics or, or 
things to angle for. Includes federally listed threatened and endangered species, migratory birds. Uh, we try to protect ref our own refuge owned lands, so adjacency to our own refuge lands. Um, we work on and, and, and other service initiatives, like I, I got to put pollinators up there for you, Jill. So, um, so we, uh, those are the types of, of things that we angle for when we do our voluntary habitat restoration work. Um, let's see. In the partners program, we, we try to uh, secure, we try to protect Uncle Sam's investment with a landowner agreement. And our, we have a minimum 10-year agreement. So um, that's um, it's really kind of a minimal thing to ask landowners to do. I mean, they, for the most part, we 10 years isn't too, you know, it's, it's pretty palatable for a lot of landowners to get into. So it's not, it's not a really ginormous burden like a per permanent easement could be. So um, cost sharing is our goal. So when, anytime we, we develop a habitat restoration project with landowners, it's really we're out we're out there trying to you know work with the landowners. They've got a little skin in the game, but we're also out there trying to find other funding sources to help uh, complete the complete the projects. Believe it or not, restoration uh, is is not cheap. So do I have a show of hands that think it is, or that it isn't? Let's see who's who who's with me that it's not cheap. That's right. So that said, uh, a big part of our talk today is going to going to revolve a lot about uh, a lot around money and uh, and say cost savings if we can. So, um, so now we'll get into the the, uh, the 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 part the reason why I'm up here, I guess, is the is the uh, life before native plant partnerships, a time that I affectionately call the dark ages. So um, it's it's threaded drama, bum bum bum. So this is uh, so before part before partnerships or plant partnerships. Uh, it was a it was a it was a time when we were all alone out in the wilderness. Uh, we were wandering aimlessly. You're supposed to envision this picture of us all wandering aimlessly out in the wilderness, but uh, there were a lot of entities doing a lot of disparate things. And um, no one entity was was coordinating with another entity to you know get things going. So it was a it was a it was a dark time. Uh, and I've obviously we talk about a lot about funding. You've heard it. You've heard the story recurring theme for today. It's a, you know restoration's expensive, seeds are expensive. Nobody, no one entity had uh, enough money to really do anything meaningful. And we were all tasked by our leadership to do more with less. Who's heard more? Do more with less. Yeah, that was us. And again, another reoccurring theme, there, there's definitely was not, never enough locally sourced plant seed material available, or you'd have to wait to get it, you know, order it or buy it or purchase it or whatever. And this, uh, uh, this always takes time. And it was a sad, sad time. This depiction on the right is, uh, is a very good uh, artist rendering of what we were going through. You know, there's, there's, there's those of us. I think Catherine's in the back there somewhere. But we, we eventually got to talking and started talking with other people. And it seemed like there was some common theme. And so we all got together and said, hey, uh, Forest Service, hey, BLM, hey, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Oregon Department of Lands, Oregon State University Extension, get some props out there, um, local soil and water conservation district. What are y'all, what's everybody doing nowadays as far as restoration? So we all got together and we started to think that, geez, I'm hearing some reoccurring themes that we might be able to, uh, to you know, maybe pile our money together and. Geez, we should create a partnership. You know, like, what do you think we could do if we all started working together? Wouldn't that be something? Well, um, we realized that, uh, and I'll use pollinators as an example. I got a little, I got an affinity for pollinators. So, 
we started to talk to you know my forest forest service counterpart or blm counterpart and everybody was being tasked at the time to start looking towards doing work for pollinators and um this was the uh, this is the good opportunity for us to say um hey we don't have enough we don't have enough money by ourselves but if we start to put money together and leverage each other's money we might be able to you know maybe move the needle somewhere so mm -hmm. That was the kind of humble beginnings of our discussions, and these three are going to get into again the nuts and bolts of kind of how that uh, those concepts have taken off from there. So, um, I think let's see. Oh, yeah, uh, it was you know one of the big one of the important things, and I their 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 part of the talk is as much a surprise to me as mine is to them. So. Uh, Maybe they'll get into the talking about local economies, but that was one of the things we talked about. Well, how do we keep local economies uh, going and thriving and uh, become a, a, an active stakeholder? So it was important to make sure that uh, that we thought about nurseries and growers. And uh, Vanessa's here, and she actually runs the Understory Initiatives Private Lands Program. So we've we worked together, and she's been able to get uh, a lot of private growers. Uh, to together and uh, and growing a lot of uh, uh, seeds and plants and we got uh, it's great good, good stuff so uh, that said we've now uh, time has gone on again these guys will probably get into the 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 particulars of it but we're one of the success stories is that we've been able to uh, work together in a partnership long enough that we've now got uh, been able to put together actual seed mixes for pollinators and it's been it's been really cool um, and very much similar to this, uh, this picture on the right, you know, you can climb a mountain and, uh, with, with any partnership, anything's possible, you can climb any sort of mountain. So I was out at the site visit like the week before last and, and, uh, and, you know, I was talking to the locals there and, uh, this is Oregon, by the way. Did you guys not know we have zebras in Oregon? Shameless plug. I actually was in Tanzania and I had to throw those in there from a couple weeks ago, so. That said, uh, that's the end of my kickoff. Hopefully I've uh, woken you all up from Taco Tuesday and I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine. Thank you, Kelly. Oh. Down. Down, Down is good. Down, Down, is, is, good. Good. Down is good. All right, well, I'm really excited to be here um, and I am very, yeah, pleased to talk to you guys about my understanding of partnerships and um, how we can learn from each other. And so I'm hoping folks want to stick around at the end to have some discussions as well, because I'm here to learn as much as I am to explain what we've done. But briefly, uh, I want to ask this question of why Native Seed Partnerships. I think it can be a little bit wiggly, like why this matters. Um, but what we found in Oregon is having better communication among stakeholders. It can be really important, because if everybody's doing the same thing in a silo, there's a lot of replication that doesn't need to actually be there. Um, and that helps you identify inefficiencies and make sure that if there's ways to do overlap um, and share resources that you're taking advantage of those. It also makes it possible to have diverse and genetically appropriate plant materials. Uh, a lot of the species we work with maybe don't have a really good economic um, possibility for farmers to be super lucrative, but they're still needed by ecosystems. And so having a diversity of ways to fund production and species prioritization, um, you know, the only way you can do that is through partnership and sharing costs and risks. And that also sort of fits into the ecologically appropriate species. And again, thinking, I, the way I kind of think about ecosystems now is, um, almost like a family system. So in a family, you have elderly people who aren't maybe contributing in the same way as the younger breadwinning age folks. And then there's little children. Um, there's and thinking of ecosystems in terms of not what is economical or what's gonna make the best output or whatever, but actually thinking about these systems as intrinsically important. And I think that in order to do restoration, you also need to have um, the structure that surrounds that work be built on something other than just straight up capitalism. Um, and I think that these partnerships are a good example of 
ways we can work together and work outside of the competitive money-oriented model to find ways to lift ecosystems and communities up. Um, and that's really how I look at this work and why I think it's so important. Um, this collaboration also helps with planning across landscapes for wild seed collection and sharing. If you collect something you don't necessarily need, but maybe your neighbor needs it, it can be really helpful. And we can also be a central collection area for lessons learned, um, equipment, and making sure that, you know, if a grower wants to start production, they don't have to go out and buy all their own equipment. They could share some of it or they could learn what not to buy from other producers or even other restoration practitioners and sharing lessons learned from science um, as well as just on the ground lessons learned. And then also it helps us prepare for climate change. There's good studies that more diverse ecosystems are more resilient to climate change. And I think that's the same for our social communities. Um, I think we're gonna be more resilient the more diverse and the more ideas we have mixing together and sharing um, to be able to be resilient to the climate change we're looking at. Um, so just get a quick rundown of the partnerships that currently exist in Oregon. Uh, we're gonna speak more in depth about a few of these, but I think the reason that I put this map up was to just highlight that still in Oregon, that has a lot of activity around native plant partnerships. There are some pretty significant gap areas. Um, we'll just kind of go through some of these. So the Willamette Valley Native Plant Partnership um, is one of the older partnerships that's been around. Rivers to Ridges is out of Eugene that kind of cover a similar geographic scope. There's also a Coastal Seed Partnership, and then we have the Umpqua. We have the Umpqua Native Plant Partnership. Uh, Tula and I work with that one. Rogue Native Plant Partnership. And then um, some of these Eastern ones we're not directly affiliated with, but we wanted to kind of show kind of their footprint in the areas that they serve to get a sense of, you know, where, where we have this connectivity and where maybe where we don't. So that's the Deschutes, East Cascades Native Plant Hub, and Ecosource, and Tula's gonna talk a little bit more in depth about each of those so we can get a landscape in our head about what is currently available. So um, this is just to say that the, the partnerships that we can really speak to and ask more or answer more specific questions are the Willamette Valley Partnership and the Coastal Native Seed Partnership. Here's some statistics or some um, summaries of those. We're gonna go into more detail in just a second here. And then after um, Kate does her talk, then Tula and I can speak to these other um, plant partnerships that are a little bit farther south. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over to Kate and go ahead and tell us about the Willamette Valley. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I coordinate two partnerships. Um, for the Institute for Applied Ecology, one is in the Willamette Valley and one on the Oregon coast. And I'll start with the Willamette Valley one and we're just gonna go south from there. Um, the Willamette Valley eco region is what this partnership covers. And it's pictured here on the left, which is a map from the Oregon Conservation Strategy. And I use this map um, because the map on the left is from 1850, showing the distribution of strategy habitats in the Willamette Valley um, versus 2004 on the right. So just to show the extent of habitat loss in this eco region over the last century and a half. Um, and some of the habitat, habitat types in the Willamette Valley in yellow are grasslands, brown are oak woodlands, green is riparian, and then there are a lot of blue wetlands and wet prairies scattered throughout, but it's hard to see on that map. Um, and then I also listed urban here just to say that this uh, ecoregion is home to nine of Oregon's 10 largest cities. So it's a very well-developed ecoregion. <clears throat> So a little history on the Willamette Valley Native Plant Partnership or the WVNPP. It's one of the longest running plant materials partnerships in Oregon. It was established in 2012. So it's entering its 12th year of partnership. And um, 
It was funded initially by a lot of contributions from partners. So partners really um, pooled together funds to get this partnership off the ground. And then we've also been funded um, a few years later, got funds from the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board and um, have funding currently from the BLM, the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And then we do also sell seed with this partnership to partners once we've paid back partners for their contributions. And so we have a big seed sales fund, a uh, growing seed sales fund that we haven't started to use yet. And so that's going to be something that we discuss with the steering committee this year. Um, and the focus for the last 11 years with this partnership has been on wet and upland prairie ecosystems. So the species that have been collected and put into production have been herbaceous, um, some some annuals and lots of perennials and then forbs and, and graminoids, but no trees or shrubs. Um, and the vision for this partnership is to increase the availability and affordability of genetically diverse and ecologically appropriate native plant materials in the Willamette Valley. And partners wanted to do this by building infrastructure and information sharing to support this work by aligning projected needs with grower capacity, by centralizing coordination. And so a halftime coordinator has been funded for most of the history of this partnership and improving the quality and genetic appropriateness of plant materials in the, in the valley. Um, the, some of the accomplishments of this partnership since 2012, seed has been collected over eight of those years from 37 different species totaling 78 pounds of wild seed collected. And most of that's been done by our collection crew for the partnership, um, which collects only from remnant sites, sites that haven't been planted and using protocols that are aligned with the Seeds of Success program. Um, 22 of those species have been entered into production and um, only we only establish fields for this partnership once we have collections from 15 or more different sites. And then we test all of our, all of the seed that comes out of those fields and make uh, test results available to partners and make the maps of, of collections available to partners as well um, to be transparent about the quality and genetic um, appropriateness. And we've distributed over 4,000 pounds of seed to partners with this partnership. 2022 is our biggest year of seed sales so far. We distributed over 600 pounds last year. Um, so this partnership is still filling an important need for the Willamette Valley. The Coastal Native Seed Partnership. Uh, I'll talk about the ecoregion first. So it's covering the coastal strip of the coast range ecoregion. So you can see it outlined in blue. Um, the geographic scope for this partnership. And um, the habitat, there are a wide variety of habitat types along the Oregon coast, but the top three here are really the focus, focal habitats for the CNSP, um, grasslands, estuaries, and dunes. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this partnership is quite a bit newer. It was established in 2020 out of uh, Oregon Silver Spot Butterfly Working Group, which is a group that um, collaborates to address limiting factors for the federally threatened Oregon Silver Spot butterfly and habitat loss along the Oregon coast is a major limiting factor for this butterfly. Um, so partners um, or partners of that working group got together and, and wanted to address the lack of genetically appropriate um, plant materials, locally sourced plant materials for um, habitat restoration projects for the Oregon Silver Spot. Um, so that's really where, where this one came out of. And it's been funded by grants. We have, um, again, a big grant from the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board for this partnership. And 
Um, I mentioned we're targeting coastal grasslands. It's a major habitat for the butterfly, as well as dunes and estuary habitats along the coast. And the vision for this one is very similar to the Willamette Valley. It's to support restoration and revegetation projects throughout the Oregon coast with genetically and ecologically appropriate native plant materials. Some accomplishments um, for the coastal partnership. A halftime coordinator has been funded for the history of this partnership. The partners have also developed a strategic plan, a priority species list, a species selection tool to help with um, picking the species that we go forward with in collection and production, and new grower resources. And we are bringing on two new coastal growers um, this year, which we're really excited about to grow some riverbank lupin. We've collected 12 pounds of wild seed for 10 priority species over the last three seasons. And a lot of those have been contributed by partners with this partnership. Um, so we don't have um, major uh, financial contributions in like the lump sum contributions that we had with the Willamette Valley partnership up front. Um, but we do have a lot of partners contributing um, in in terms of seed as well as um, other resources. And I think I'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide as well. Um, and we enter, we've entered three species into partnership production so far and adopted three additional coastal production fields. And then we're also, we have some funding from a Oregon Silver Spot butterfly uh, grant to start five additional smaller production fields for through this partnership this year. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the unsolved regional problems um, that these partnerships are facing. And we'll kind of um, go through those with each of the regions and then bring it back together at the end of the presentation. But for the Willamette Valley, Partnership, one of the bigger challenges is seed cost. Um, one of the goals that was outlined in the original strategic plan for this partnership was to lower the costs of plant materials in the Willamette Valley. And seed prices are still a barrier for many partners. Um, at the same time, where another goal is to increase marketplace stability. And in that vein, the partnership tries not to undersell commercial growers on the market. Um, so we don't, we don't lower our prices below other growers, but that's a challenging balance to strike. Um, and we're still figuring out how to make seed more available in the Willamette Valley. Grower continuity is another one. We're really fortunate to have a lot of folks with extensive knowledge and experience involved in native seed production in the Valley currently, um, and we think about and want to be prepared for a time when those folks might move on or retire and continue to grow a thriving market in the Valley. And we're continually looking for new growers to keep that market um, stable. Climate change, we haven't solved it in the Valley. Um, <laughs> We are starting a new committee this year that will develop a proposal to the full partnership about um, how we want to prepare for the future climate that our native species will encounter once we put the seed back onto the landscape in the valley. But that's a conversation that involves a lot of really challenging pieces, a lot of unknown variables. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be a process, um, but we're really excited to start that process in the valley. For the Coastal Native Seed Partnership, um, a bigger challenge is that there's just still a lack of coastal genetics on the native seed market um, on the coast. And this partnership is earlier on in its development. Um, there are also a lot of other efforts going on along the coast, um, smaller smaller scale efforts and regional efforts. And you'll hear about efforts down south as well that um, go out to the coast. Um, but, and then up north, there's also 
um, the Northwest Oregon Restoration Partnership, which they're here and, and giving a few talks at the conference as well. And they do a lot of container production for the coast. So there are a lot of efforts going on around across the coast, but um, in terms of locally sourced um, seed, um, it's still a, a limited, there's a limited supply available for partners. So a lot of folks are still using um, seed from outside of the coastal region. Forecasting seed needs is a big one. And of, of course, a lot of these challenges cross between partnerships as well, I guess I should say. But um, these are kind of the bigger ones, the ones that are really standing out for these individual partnerships. So forecasting seed needs, um, our partners have a lot of barriers that they're facing and being able to predict what seed they're going to need for their projects. And those things are out of their control and out of our control to really address things like burning timelines and permitting and funding timelines, um, finding out that they have funding available and needing to use it right away. Um, so it's a struggle to figure out um, what species to move forward with. And I think they talked in one of the morning sessions about the timeline of seed collection and production, and it just doesn't, it's hard to line all of those factors up. And then long-term funding for this partnership, I mentioned it's been funded by grants and um, it's still really early on in this partnership and it really takes a few years to get partnerships like this off the ground. So we're continually looking for additional funding opportunities to keep building this partnership. And I think that's it for me for now. I'll pass it off to Catherine. Great, okay, so we're moving south. Um, you can see on the map, we're kind of in the, the purple area. This is the Umpqua Basin. Um, and so this is the probably one of the newest partnerships in Oregon. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. The habitat types are pretty diverse. Um, the partnership is defined by the Umpqua Basin, but there's several ecoregions within that. Um, and we're at the beginning of the building this partnership. And so the, the focal or priority habitats haven't necessarily been identified clearly other than oak savanna, but there's probably gonna be an emphasis um, on some of these other habitats as well, oak savanna, oak woodland. Um, it kind of depends on where projects are gonna happen in the future and where there's the greatest need. Um, in this area, it's been, you know, the Willamette Valley is to the north, but there's different plants, different ecoregions, and in the Umpqua, there just has not been really any um, supply of native seed that's you know locally collected. The best they're able to do is source things from the rogue, but that also has been recently developed. And so um, that represents a big gap area, and it's a, a place where we're trying to put a lot of energy to um, have regionally appropriate seed sources for the restoration work that's going on there. So the Umpqua Native Plant Partnership was modeled off of the Rogue Native Plant Partnership, which I started in 2016. And we thought that instead of reinventing the wheel, we may as well use the model we developed and see if it was transferable. And so this was the first chance that we had of, of seeing how it would work to kind of transfer some of the lessons learned and the you know, documents and different processes that we developed to a different region and to see if it still held water. Um, and so far, it seems to be working pretty well. The Umpqua Native Plant Partnership uh, is funded by Fish and Wildlife Service and Forest Service. Currently, we got our first round of grants recently, and then we have um, BLM funding in the pipeline uh, currently that just hasn't quite come through yet, but we've applied for it. And so that's enough to support a part-time coordinator who lives locally in the Umpqua. I live in the Rogue Valley, um, but we provide like mentorship and um, my nonprofit supports uh, Morgan, who's the coordinator as a staff member, but she lives in the Umpqua. Um, and we find that it's really important to have a local person um, managing the seed collections and, you know, checking in with phenology and having their um, sort of connections in the community so that they know what's needed because it can vary greatly what region you're in, what problems you're needing to fix. Um, 
And yeah, I guess just to reemphasize that the Umpqua and the Rogue are very botanically and habitat diverse regions. And so there's a lot of nuance and a lot of um, species that are not really applicable in any, you know, only one area, they'd be applicable and then you move not very far and then that species does not occur. So we have to divide and conquer sometimes or just pick a, a habitat and, and ignore other habitats because there's just too many species to get all in production at once. Um, and again, very similar goals. We're just trying to support the local economy, local growers, but with the goal of, of really increasing um, the diversity and you know functioning of ecosystems in a meaningful way. And so in the short time that the Umpqua partnership has existed, we do have Morgan and that, so you can see her in the white box there, she's um, the coordinator. And then she has kind of support from me and Tula who have a little bit more institutional knowledge. And then we hold regular meetings and there we just formed a steering committee that's sort of guiding um, some of the nuts and bolts type decisions for the partnership. And then we have larger group meetings to talk about, you know, making sure that we are all sharing resources and are on the same page and understand the trajectory. Um, we've had six seed collection events and we've collected 43 species at about seven and a half raw pounds. And then we're in the middle of putting together the final touches on the website and sort of building the outreach. And we're kind of in the outreach and um, sort of scoping stage of this partnership. And then working on an MOU, which is a Memorandum of Understanding, if you all don't know that acronym, um, and working towards a five-year strategic plan. Okay, um, and this is a map of the Rogue. And so we're, the Umpqua kind of is nestled up right north. And this is the Rogue. We're, you know, kind of right at the California border. Um, actually, on this map, I, I believe the, the Rogue Basin does dip into California there at the bottom a little bit. Um, but just to get you situated, um, and, and Oregon is the, the space between Washington and California, if any of you <laughs> needed help with that. <laughs> um, you know, just to clear that up. Um, yeah, and again, so the, the Rogue Basin is very botanically diverse. There's, I think other than the Rocky Mountains and, and maybe one other area in the United States, it's one of the most speciose, at least for plant communities of anywhere in the country. And so again, that's a challenge, it's a unique challenge, um, different from the Willamette where there's fewer habitats to focus on. Um, we have to be really careful, you know, we can, um, drive 20 minutes and be in serpentine soils that have plant species that are adapted to basically toxic soils. They're going to grow a lot differently. We're going to have a lot. Um, we could only, we don't want to collect that seed and be willy nilly with it. And so we have to really pay attention to some of those specifics. Um, and yeah, we, I think the Rogue Native Plant Partnership, our focus is more on grasslands and oak savannas but we do work sometimes with the Forest Service and try to help bolster some of their pollinator mix availability. And so we do forbs and grasses sort of in those forested contexts. Um, but yeah, it's really more about forbs and grasses currently, but there's kind of a need for it all. Um, so the Rogue Native Plant Partnership was funded initially by the Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Wildlife Service and Forest Service, kind of a, a trifecta of federal support at the beginning. We also had um, some support from the Nature Conservancy, Oregon Department of Transportation. Um, right now we're kind of in a funding gap, and so the Confederated Tribes of the Sluts Indians came to our rescue, and um, we got some funding to sort of bridge the gap while we wait for a BLM agreement to come to fruition. Um, we also, like in the Willamette, when we have excess seed that has been produced for different projects, the partnership functions as a way to make that seed available to not just practitioners, but also members of the public. And so we have, um, you know, we've had a seed sale for the last four years. Um, we vary from, you know, selling a couple thousand dollars worth of seed, whereas this last time around, I think it was $20,000 worth of seed. Um, and so that can go obviously to the federal entities and the, the folks that support us, but also private landowners um, and nonprofits. And we provide technical advice to some of the groups that don't have botanists on staff to help them come up with a seed mix. We developed a seed mix calculator 
Um, and are really just trying to provide that technical assistance so that folks can make good decisions about, you know, what, what they need in their ecosystems within reason. Um, climate change is something that we're trying to wrap our heads around. Um, and we don't have any answers, but I think it's going to be a combination of putting things into practice and learning and also trying to find ways to do research while we do restoration. Um, because I don't think we have time to wait for the science to tell us what is going to be the best route. Um, yeah. And let's see, the accomplishments are, one of the things I'm really proud of is we have over 40 members of our memorandum of understanding. Um, and so that's a variety of different players in the Valley that, and this is not a like, highly populated area, it's a pretty small community, and to have that much buy-in was really exciting to me uh, moving to the area. Uh, we also have a five-year strategic plan that we're working on implementing, um, and part of that is a native seed business plan, and that's available on our website if anybody is really like wanting to get into the economics of um, seed production and sort of the different tracks that one might take to get species produced kind of in that family mindset of not just only focusing on the species that are economical, but ones that are needed by ecosystems. Um, and then we also have um, sort of a, a small but growing set of equipment that can be used for seed cleaning and also farming practices. And one of the big pushes we've had in the Rogue is since we didn't have um, existing seed farms per se, we've been basically converting <laughs> farmers who are, you know, organic seed growers for vegetable crops and convincing them to grow a few plots of native species, giving them the seed, you know, we find it, we bring it to them. Uh, Vanessa, who is maybe not in, oh, she's right there, um, walks them through, you know, beginning to end, like trains them on all of the, the specifics of how to grow native seed. Um, and then we have a hybrid model where we pay um, them to initiate the bed, so they have a little money up front, and then they also get a payment based on yield. So they're still, um, and it's, it's really like a hand-holding situation, but we've found that that's the only way um, for us to get seed produced, and it sort of spreads out that risk where people already have farms, they you know are already doing other things, and they add this in, and then they can grow from there as opposed to just starting a brand new business where all you do is native seed, and then you have to wait four years for your first harvest, and it just is really hard. Um, so that, that's a really good model for us. And then, of course, um, having this blueprint be available and sort of open source and available for people to steal and modify and um, use. So unsolved problems. Yeah, the UMQA is in its infancy, lacking some funding and infrastructure to actually get plant materials produced. I have a grant that's getting reviewed currently that should hopefully solve some of those problems, but it's sort of this constant process of um, finding the right money source to, to support different parts of it. And it, um, the coordination especially can be hard to fund, but it's the only way I've found to actually get to the point where you can get consensus on what you wanna grow, where and when and by whom. And then um, we need to do um, habitat specific research um, to see which uh, seed mixes are gonna be the most appropriate and which ones are gonna be used by practitioners. And in the Rogue, um, we, yeah, are really trying to be more proactive about climate change and it's really scary because nobody has answers. Um, but I think we just need to start acting and learning and being willing to make mistakes um, so that we can learn where we're headed and at least maybe learn what not to do. Um, and then we lack capacity currently for riparian species seed production, but that's a couple of grant proposals away to sort of build that up. But we definitely focus on forbs and grasses, but we see a need for the riparian work as well. And then we're in a coordination funding gap, so that's another challenge, but we're working through it. Okay, now Tula's gonna take over, and these are partnerships that we're not associated with, but we did some scoping calls and we just kind of wanted to paint the picture of what's going on in Oregon. So take it away, Tula. Thank you. So um, like Catherine said, I, we don't have direct relationships with all of the other native seed working groups in Oregon, and um, they may not function under the same partnership structure as the Rogue and Willamette 
Coastal and Umpqua Native Plant Partnerships, but I did want to give them a shout out. And um, I did have a chance to talk to Ecosource Native Seeds, and these ladies are in Harney Basin. There were two of them. And uh, they have this vision of converting this huge um, agricultural area that's really focused on growing alfalfa. Uh, they launched in 2018. They've done some seed collection. Um, they're facing, like I said, a severe drought. Well, all of all of the West is. Western Oregon is in a bad situation. Eastern Oregon, I think, is even worse if you look at the state map of how bad the drought is. And uh, they told me that they have 20,000 Oh, there's a zero missing, but <laughs> there's 20,000 acres of farmland there that um, the Oregon State Water Board says you have to stop pumping groundwater to grow this alfalfa. This should be a desert. <laughs> and so their goal is to start convincing the local farmers that growing native seed is financially viable and that it's needed, there's a market for it. And so they've started some um, trial plots of, of native grass seeds and um, are, are building from there. Start, starting seed is a, is a challenge, is a barrier. Um, they have some small wild collections, but uh, often takes a couple years of visiting these remnant populations to actually collect enough seed to put in us even like a tenth of an acre bed. So it um, sounds like they're working on a BLM cooperative agreement to get that part of their partnership underway. And um, the interesting thing about Ecosource too is that they kind of grew out of like um, a local regional economic development grant. So they weren't even like trying to specifically work on ecological problems. They were just handed money by the state saying, help us with this drought situation. And <laughs> this is the solution that they came up with. Um, the Deschutes Basin Native Plant Seed Bank, I, and I didn't get to have a conversation with these guys. They're, um, an, I think, grew out of a native plant nursery and um, they're pretty busy right now with plant production. So we're gonna try to catch each other in the fall. But um, they're, some, they're um, in the active process of collecting seeds providing technical support for people on the ground who were um, applying seeds, and then providing some of the excess seed from the grow outs to the public. Uh, over in the East Cascades, so um, you'll see the little pink region up there on the map. Thanks for making those awesome, awesome maps, Catherine. Yeah. Very helpful. Uh, these guys um, have an educational partnership. So it's a, another slightly different model. They um, started out with the Oregon State University lab that's um, based out of Bend, Oregon, and um, partnered with a, a local nursery and the National Park Service. And this is a, a pretty new initiative launched last year. Um, they're involving students. They're getting out there and showing them the whole process of from wild collecting seed to growing seeds uh, at the farm at OSU, I believe, and then just doing some restoration with native plants. a lot of shade, sagebrush step ecosystems out there uh, east of the Cascades. And they're actually presenting here um, at 3.30, so you guys can catch them. Um, last I checked Hoover, it was still in the Edison room, so I don't know if they'll get moved also, but check your Hoover. <laughs> and that will be with Rich Martinson and Matt Schinderman. Um, I did get a chance to talk to these guys. Um, they don't appear on the map because they're fully just focusing on the wet Eugene's wetlands, which is a small geographical area, but very uh, critically ecologically important. I had a chance to speak with the um, coordinator, Diane Steek, and um, she had a lot to tell me because she's been doing this for a long time. Uh, this is probably the oldest native plant materials partnership in Oregon. There's three main partners, the city of Eugene, and then the BLM, who's uh, the manager for a lot of the wetland habitat lands, and then the Nature Conservancy. They do grouts. They have very specific growers that they work with. They kind of do the same thing year after year, and they have their um, process pretty well dialed in. Western Meadowlark, Oregon State Bird, likes wetlands. Um, yes, and then we have some native plant nurseries. 
So um, these aren't seed partnerships per se, but uh, we also wanted to include them, um, working in the native plant materials um, universe. And uh, most of these are tribal run. So they're developing native plant materials basically for um, restoration projects on tribal lands. We also have the uh, Northwest Oregon Restoration Partnership. Um, it's up, way up in Tillamook, Oregon. Um, Clarno, Clearwater Nursery, Heritage Seedlings, Pacific Northwest Natives, Winter Creek Nursery. Some of these are new. Somebody added to my slide. <laughs> um, like I said, I don't have a lot of information on these guys, but um, they're out there. And here's a map. Wow. But, uh, hmm. Oh yeah, there's there's diamonds. Okay, cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, I believe that's the end of my section. Passing it back to Catherine. Okay, so I guess I wanna talk about what's working and then we can get into the stuff I'm really interested in and what are the unsolved problems and what do you all think? So um, I think a really good strategy that's worked in Oregon is doing a needs assessment at the beginning of building any partnership and really making sure you're catering your solutions to actual problems that exist and not just things that are easy to solve or um, don't, they're not a problem. But we've found that pretty much everything is a problem, so, <laughs> or hard or challenging or you need to build it, so um, maybe, maybe we need to take that one off and just fix all the problems. Uh, having a dedicated coordinator has been really crucial. Um, I think that a lot of us can feel the pressure of having a job that, you know, yes, you're supposed to reach out to other groups, but it actually never happens. Um, and so having somebody, um, in our case, our coordinators tend to be housed by a local nonprofit, and then it's that person's job, or at least part of their job, to um, make sure meetings happen on a schedule, do the outreach, be the central person where questions can get answered by the community, by other rest restoration practitioners and to like make those connections, sort of be the connective tissue. Um, and that has been really um, not that hard to find funding for. And if you can find, like when I started, I was fresh out of grad school and so I was cheap um, to have be a part-time coordinator. So um, being able to, to get people with that energy and have those soft skills, but also really care about the landscapes can really um, get the energy moving in the right direction. Um, being locally led while also being connected to other partnerships, you know, on a larger scale so you can learn. Um, I know me personally, when I was building the Rogue Native Plant Partnership, I stole so much stuff from Institute for Applied Ecology who had preceded me. And I, you know, borrowed their language and of course asked for permission, but really like why reinvent the wheel and start over when there's really good models out there, but also being open-minded to, you don't need to necessarily do everything the exact same way. We've definitely innovated and found different, we have different problems, so we have different solutions. Um, I think having growers as stakeholders is crucial. Um, we need to consider the barriers and the challenges that growers face as much as we need to consider what we want our landscapes to look like in the future and what restoration means. And so it's just really important to take those very real circumstances and barriers into account when you're at the very beginning. Um, and sometimes it can feel a little like, collusion where you're giving all the growers like market secrets of all the things that they should grow. But in the current state we're in of not having enough plant materials, period, um, it's, you know, any help they can get is great because that means more plant materials. There's not really any losers in that situation. And we've found that growers, once they get comfortable with the way the partnership operates and the transparency and the, you know, what they sort of receive 
um, in terms of like knowledge and training for free, um, they're really willing to also share what they've learned and say, hey, I, I couldn't get this, you know, ranunculus to germinate. What did you do? And, and so like all those growers in our network are also um, communicating and sharing their, you know, long history of um, expertise with each other. And then I, I think another really thing that's working in Oregon is flexibility. You've seen examples of multiple different models. Um, and I think that flexibility and, and being able to shift when things aren't working is a really strong point that I would recommend if you're going to start a partnership. OK, so we have made it so far. We've developed some partnerships. I feel like we're part of the way to our end goal. Um, which is sort of not having gap areas and having plant materials available. But I think one of the, 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 the part we're in in Oregon um, is this need for kind of that bigger vision or bigger umbrella type thinking of what functionally as a state do we need to put into place as far as support structures and systems they are going to allow um, these individual partnerships to be successful. And so um, we are working together, you know, the folks here and other groups that do plant materials work. We're trying to um, put together an Oregon native seed strategy that's um, built off of the national seed strategy. And this would really be, um, oh, I'm taking your slide. I'll finish and then I'll stop. <laughs> I got so excited. I, I even put pictures up there to remind myself. Um, but yeah, so the, the idea is to sort of have that collaboration on a statewide level and really leverage resources in an efficient way, but have that locally led element where the existing partnerships in these different regions have support that they needed, but they're, they're able to direct things the way that makes sense. And then also the hope would be we can expand um, into some of those gap areas. Okay, I'm gonna hand it off. <laughs> talk about what you want to talk about. <clears throat> yeah, so I get to talk about the Oregon Native Seed Strategy, I guess. Um, it's a statewide initiative, um, like Catherine mentioned, and it's being... Um, it's being kicked off by the Oregon Native Plant Conservation Coalition, which is a recently formed regional coalition, um, us plus the Oregon Flora Project, the Ray Selling Berry Seed Bank, and the Oregon Department of Agriculture. And it's going to dovetail with the Oregon Conservation Strategy, which is a strategy that um, focuses on fish and wildlife conservation needs across the state of Oregon. And it has a really great website full of resources, which is, this is a screenshot of the website um, that you can go to and look at the priorities that have been broken down in the strategy by ecoregion. And so the Oregon Native Seed Strategy will um, similarly break down seed priorities by ecoregion and um, we'll have a, a website portal and all of that. And I'll talk about more about that within the goals. But this is our, this is the overall uh, list of goals. And I'll go more into each of these. But it, if you're familiar with the National Seed Strategy, they'll look familiar. Um, we, the last one, identifying gene conservation needs is, um, an additional one that we're adding for the state of Oregon, but their national seed strategy goals. And the first goal is to identify seed needs. So that involves seed selection and planning, identifying target species for seed collection in each ecoregion. It's expanding seed collection for conservation, restoration, increase, and in storage, and in increasing participation in the Seeds of Success program across the state, um, identifying workhorse species to prioritize as well as rare and culturally important species. And then expanding seed production and storage capacity is another piece of that, and assessing both short and long-term needs um, to do that 
and um, what our current resources are like. The second goal is to identify research needs to improve technology for native seed production and ecosystem restoration across the state. That involves identifying knowledge gaps and um, both in production and in restoration and um, <clears throat> conducting species specific research to provide protocols on technology storage and production that can help growers and pr practitioners across the state doing this work. It will also include developing seed transfer guidelines, characterizing genetic variation and delineating seed zones across the state and developing seed transfer guidelines for projected future environmental conditions as well as current. And then conducting restoration outcomes research. So looking at plant establishment on restoration sites, species interactions, both native and non-native long-term ecological restoration impacts and outcomes and monitoring techniques and developing or modifying those as needed. The third goal is to develop and implement tools that support production and use of genetically appropriate seed. And that involves developing web-based infrastructure and online tools for land managers and growers, such as a online resource library um, that would make those species specific protocols available and accessible to folks across the state and developing a seed marketplace for land managers um, to be able to easily find genetically appropriate seed for their projects. Also developing climate change adaptation be best practices and ecosystem or eco region specific guidance on how to best prepare for climate change. Uh, I mentioned that's something that Willamette Valley is starting to work on and coordinating those efforts across the state is a really urgent need. And developing a native plant partnership roadmap would be another tool um, that can guide stakeholders through the process of developing new partnerships that, again, don't need to look the same, but don't need to reinvent the wheel also and take some of the burden off of individual partnerships and in, um, providing resources for um, doing that work. And then the fourth goal is to develop and implement communication strategies and that would involve developing an online portal for the Oregon Native Seed Strategy, similar to the Oregon Conservation Strategy, that can communicate the strategy to a broader audience and provide tools um, to, uh, to the practitioners and growers and collectors, as well as to the public. And um, another piece of this is prioritizing input and participation from native communities and other underserved communities across the state and identifying barriers to participation in this effort um, to make sure everyone is involved. And then strengthening communication networks across political boundaries so that we're um, making sure that seed being used is genetically and ecologically appropriate. And then the last goal is to identify gene conservation needs. And this is again, a new one from the national seed strategy. Um, but for Oregon, identifying XC2 storage needs, plants of conservation concern that would benefit from long-term seed storage and um, inventorying and assessing our current accessions and what's in storage right now, um, being able to replace those as needed, developing a system of periodic review of the accessions that we have and um, doing viability testing on those accessions and then developing a collection strategy for um, refreshing and starting those um, those collections and um, figuring out how to do the storage piece as well and identifying infrastructure limitations like storage facilities, technology, um, collection crews. Um, so we're really excited for this initiative to continue to move forward and become an important resource for folks across the state of Oregon. Um, we invite anyone to join us where um, we want to have the right people at the table for this 
effort and anyone who has ideas or input from Oregon or outside of Oregon as well, please get in touch with us and, um, and also let us know if there are any barriers to participating in this effort. And I think, I think that's it. We can move on to questions. Yeah, and we, our thought was, um, we have like a little bit of an activity. And let's see what time we have left. So we have 15 minutes. Um, my preference would be to break up into groups and discuss a few of these issues. Are you guys all good with that? You can throw up your questions. Just because I want to get your thoughts. Um, you want to go to the next slide? Is that okay? I'm going to just say no questions. <laughs> <laughs> I just really, I just really want to know what you guys think on this. It's your birthday. So we have three topics, and this part is totally optional. I get intimidated by small group discussions. Um, so leave if you want, and it's scary. Um, oh wait, where's the buttons? But yeah, we have three questions we're interested in talking about, and I just have like a quick worksheet that if you get into a group and self-organize. Um, go around, do a round robin and sort of feel out what people are sort of struggling with or what have they have thoughts on. But basically all I would ask is pick a topic, find your other group members, have somebody take notes and we have a, a little worksheet here. And then a round robin of everybody in the group and there's sort of questions sort of pre-built into this and then just be able to report back. And if we don't get to the reporting back, it'll be written down um, and then we can put it together and I'll share it later after the talk is over um, or after I guess the conference is over. Optional. Oh, that went away fast. Okay, um, so let's see, group one can go over here. Group two, maybe back in that weird LCOV place. And then group three can go there. And so pick the question you care about or makes you angry or whatever um, and find your people and yeah, just do a quick round robin and please somebody be brave and take notes. I will not judge your handwriting because I have the worst. <laughs>